How can a bike cost 10K? Well, it's a question that we get asked quite a lot here at GCN, and one that we're being asked more and more, as each year seems to bring more bikes to market with a price tag of 10 grand or above. Take last year, for example, we saw the release of both the specialized S-Works Tarmac and S-Works Athos, both with prices well in excess of 10 grand. Other top brands such as Trek and BMC also released models at this price point. And brands such as Giant with its TCR Advanced SL Zero and Canyon with its CFR models weren't far behind with prices of nine and a half grand. So in this video, we're gonna take a look at why top end bikes can be so expensive. Top end bikes typically have higher quality carbon frames made from a higher grade of carbon fiber with a more complicated layup and a larger number of individual carbon pieces within that layup. You can also expect the best components, the best wheels, and increasingly, top end bikes come with power meters too. To many people, a price of 10K seems ridiculous. But when you think about it, the price of many things is ridiculous. Diamonds, for example, or have you even considered bottled water? In many instances, it's more than petrol. Ludicrous. A common comparison or objection people make is that for 10 grand, you, can, you could buy a motorbike for that. Well, you could, so let's take a look. For the sake of argument, for roughly 10K, you could buy yourself a Pinarello Dogma, or keeping it equally Italian, and with 111 more horsepower, you could opt for a Ducati Monster. Incidentally, the Ducati Monster is the entry-level Ducati. But the first thing we need to consider is the relative size of the two companies. For the 2015-16 physical year, Pinarello Holdings reported an annual revenue of 52 million euros. 90% of its sales came from outside Europe. The company has approximately 50 employees and sells in approximately 50 countries worldwide. And its output in terms of numbers of frames and bicycles, its number of units sold, was around 30,000. By comparison, Ducati in 2019 sold over 53,000 units, and that was to over 90 countries. And there's a relative size, their company has 1,500 employees, so quite a lot bigger. Now, that 53,000 motorbikes uh, equated to around 713 million euros in turnover, which had 52 million euros in operating profit. Quite the difference. Ducati is quite a small company in automotive terms, and, well, arguably you could buy a car for 10K. So, keeping it Italian, I found a basic spec Fiat 500 for sale, or Cinquecento, and, um, well, looking into the financial records of the Fiat Chrysler Corporation, we can see that for the 2018 year, they reported a turnover of 110 billion euros. Bonkers, absolutely mad. And that equates to sales of around four and a half million cars per annum, which is absolutely huge. Massive, massive numbers. The far larger scale of this production helps reduce costs at both manufacturing and supply chain levels. For example, the OEM components used in the automotive industry are produced in far greater numbers and therefore available at significantly lower cost. These include things such as tyres or spark plugs, but also gaskets, all sorts of bits, even gearboxes. Large car companies usually design and build their own engines, whereas bike companies have to purchase the group sets on their bikes from one of the big three companies, Shimano, SRAM, or Campagnolo. And the group set represents a significant proportion of the overall cost of a bike. Larger bike brands purchase group sets in larger quantities, and this can reduce the cost slightly, meaning that they can save a bit of money. 
In a bid to keep costs down and reduce the number of parts that bike brands buy from OEM companies, we've increasingly seen bike companies produce their own finishing kit and OEM parts and fit them to their bikes. Classic examples would be Specialized with Roval, Trek with Bontrager or Pinarello with Most. Just to be clear, I'm not here to justify the price of top-end bikes, but merely discuss it. And the next big thing that affects the price of a bike, or, well, anything we buy, is the free market. People criticise the price of bikes, but it is largely down to the free market, and that dictates that the price of something can only be what the customer is prepared to pay for it. And marketing and branding can increase the desirability of an item, but if it's deemed overpriced and you know, too expensive, then it won't sell in sufficient numbers or at a sufficient rate to make it or the company successful. In addition, if a product is deemed to be vastly overpriced, nothing stops another company selling a similar product at a far lower price, undercutting them. The advantage of the free market is it allows for competition. The next thing to factor in is labour. Lower production runs result in a higher cost, and making carbon fibre bikes is also a very labour-intensive process. It's done largely by hand, and each individual frame tends to take hundreds of hours to make. In comparison, largely automated manufacturing processes, such as the automotive industry again, which uses robots for much of its production line, can produce things at far lower cost. However, on the smaller production runs of bikes, this usually isn't economically efficient at the moment. This too is likely to be a factor in the price rise we've seen of bikes, because the labour cost is the biggest single cost in the manufacturing of a carbon fibre frame, and it's the reason why many bike brands relocated to countries such as Taiwan and China because of that lower labour cost. However, as the economies of these countries have grown, and grown pretty rapidly, that labour cost has increased too. Logistics and business models can also affect the price. Consider that many bike brands employ a retail model where they have separate companies for the retail and the distribution of their products. Then if you have two bikes that are similarly specced, if one of the companies is using this separate retail uh, and distribution model, then the retailer and the distributor also eat into the profit that the bike company can make. If you compare this to a bike company such as Canyon or, or Bayer that employ a direct sales model, they can then pass that saving through not having a retailer and a distributor onto the customer. A direct-to-consumer model is what car brands do, and they additionally make revenue through selling finance deals and servicing packages. Perhaps the bike industry could learn a thing or two. Fortunately, to get a brilliant bike, you don't have to spend 10k. There are loads of great bikes out there for around 400 to 600 pounds euros or dollars, and there's used bargains out there too. If you want to spend more money going from that sort of 600 mark up to 3,000, you'll see a big increase in spec and performance. But then going higher from sort of 3K to 10K, there is an increase in performance, but it's significantly less, and it's definitely a case of diminishing returns. But the bike industry isn't one that is just hell-bent on profit. It's an industry built on passion, and it's not one to get into if you do want to make millions. In fact, there's a saying that's pretty telling that is, well, the best way to make a million in the bike industry is to start with two. I hope you found this video informative and useful, and if you have, you know the drill. Give it a thumbs up and subscribe. And vote in our poll. Would you ever spend 10K on a bike if you could afford it? Can a bike ever be worth 10 grand? Let us know.